जय हिंद माई सेल्फ डॉक्टर मृणालिनी अग्रवाल सीनियर लेक्चरर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ पेरेडोंटोलॉजी सुभारती डेंटल कॉलेज एंड हॉस्पिटल स्वामी विवेकानंद सुभारती यूनिवर्सिटी मेरठ उत्तर प्रदेश तो टुडे आई एल बी डिस्कसिंग द टॉपिक डेंटल प्लाक एज वी ऑल नो द प्लाक इज द मेन इटियोलॉजिक एजेंट बिहाइंड एनी पेरेडोंटल डिजीज सो इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट दैट वी अंडरस्टैंड द टॉपिक थरली so in today's lecture i'll be discussing the classification and composition of dental plaque the microbial complexes the formation of plaque and the theories related to plaque formation the microbial shift from health to disease and in the end we will have a short quiz just to have a revision of whatever we have discussed in the lecture so to begin with dental plaque can be defined as a specific but highly variable structural entity which results from sequential colonization of microorganisms on tooth surfaces restorations and other parts of oral cavity and it is composed of salivary components like mucin desquamated epithelial cells debris and microorganisms which are all embedded together in an extracellular gelatinous matrix this definition of dental plaque is the most accepted one and it was given by world health organization that is who in the year 1961 now some other important terminologies which we should know first of all dental calculus it is an adherent calcified or calcifying mass that forms on the surface of natural teeth and prosthesis we can also remember dental plaque as nothing but calcified plaque now coming to materia alba it is a deposit which is composed of aggregate of microorganisms leukocytes and dead exfoliated epithelial cells its main property is that it is randomly organized and loosely adherent to the surfaces of teeth plaque and gingiva and it can be removed merely by air spray now going back to the history of dental plaque antony van leeuwenhoek was the first one to describe dental plaque biofilms and their resistance sir so g v black in 1899 coined the term gelatinous microbic plaque verhog in 1950 was the first one to describe a bacterial plaque in the etiology of periodontal disease and in the year 1965 low et al stated that plaque is the main etiologic agent behind periodontal diseases now let us discuss about the classification of dental plaque as we all know broadly dental plaque can be classified as supragingival plaque and subgingival plaque depending upon its location on the surface of the tooth so supragingival plaque can further be classified subclassified as coronal plaque marginal plaque and fissural plaque on the other hand subgingival plaque can be classified as tooth associated unattached and tissue associated plaque now what is supragingival plaque as the name suggests it is the plaque which is found at or above the gingival margin and now we'll discuss what are the various kinds of other plaque so marginal plaque is the supragingival plaque which comes in direct contact with the gingival margin that is known as marginal plaque so this is the gingival margin and the plaque which is found at or above the gingival margin is called as supragingival plaque and the plaque which is found in association or in direct contact with the gingival margin is known as marginal plaque now coming to the subgingival plaque as the name suggests it is the plaque which is found below the gingival margin between the tooth and the gingival cellular tissue so we can see here in this diagram the arrow is representing the subgingival plaque at is as it is found between the gingival cellular tissue and the tooth now this is another diagram which represents the various kinds of subgingival plaque so here we have the tooth attached plaque which is in direct contact with the tooth the unattached plaque which is unattached or unadherent to the tooth surface 
and the epithelial associated plaque which is found in association with gingival epithelium. So now we have discussed about tooth attached, unattached and tissue attached plaque. They differ slightly in their composition, their extension and their fate. So to this table is representing the difference between the all three types of the subgingival plaque. Tooth attached plaque is mainly composed of gram positive microorganisms like rods and cocci. The unattached plaque is formed of gram negative rods, filaments and spirochetes. While the tissue attached plaque which is found in association with gingival epithelium it is found uh, to be composed of both gram positive and gram negative microorganisms. So, the tooth attached plaque it does not extend to the junctional epithelium while the unattached and the tissue attached plaque may extend to junctional epithelium also. Now as the tooth attached plaque it is found in association with the tooth it can result in the formation of calculus or root caries and it may penetrate the cementum also while the unattached plaque it results in the formation of gingivitis that it that is it will result in the inflammation of gingiva while the tissue attached plaque means that the plaque has penetrated the tissue so it can result in gingivitis and may further progress into periodontitis so this was uh, the difference between the three types of subgingival plaque now coming to the next uh, topic that is composition of dental plaque so it is very important to understand the composition of dental plaque to know about the various microorganisms which form the plaque and which result in its uh, being the main etiologic agent behind the development of periodontal diseases. So basically the plaque it consists of 20 to 30 percent of intercellular matrix and the bulk of the plaque is formed that is 80 percent of it is composed of various kinds of microorganisms. So we will be discussing both the intercellular matrix and the microorganisms which constitute the dental plaque. To begin uh, with the intercellular matrix it can again be divided into organic and inorganic portion. So the organic matrix it consists of polysaccharides which is produced by bacteria for example dextran and protein like albumin glycoproteins which are derived from saliva and lipids. On the other hand inorganic matrix it is predominantly main consists of or inorganic materials like calcium and phosphorus they are the major elements and sodium potassium and fluoride they are found in traces. Now the source of inorganic material is basically derived from saliva in case of the plaque is suprajingival and it is derived from gingival crevicular fluid in case the plaque is subgingival plaque okay so this is an important point to remember now coming to the main and the very important aspect of dental plaque we have already discussed that 80 percent of the bulk of plaque is formed of microorganisms so it is very important that we know what kind of microorganisms which all microorganisms are present in the plaque and which are pathogenic to the oral environment. It has been found and has been proven that 1 gram of plaque it contains approximately 2 into 10 to the power 11 bacteria, and in our dental plaque more than 500 distinct type of microbial species have been found. So this was the about the bacteria which are present. Now apart from bacteria, non-bacterial species are also found in the dental plaque which may be mycoplasma, yeast, protozoa and various viruses. So just now we have discussed that about 500 different type of bacterial species are found in the dental plaque and it is practically impossible that we study about each and every bacterial species. So for better understanding so Kransky in the year 1980, 1998 he obtained 
13,000 subgingival plaque samples from about 185 individuals and then by the technique of DNA hybridization, he studied those uh, samples which were obtained and broadly divided them into seven different bacterial complexes which are known as the microbial complexes which were given by Sokransky. Now we will be discussing about each microbial complex one by one. As you can see in the diagram, the various complexes, blue complex, violet complex, green complex, yellow complex, orange complex and red complex. All these complexes, they are constituted by different kind of bacteria. So now we will be discussing about them. First of all, these seven complexes, based on their properties, they were divided into two groups that is primary colonizers or the early colonizers and secondary colonizers or the late colonizers. So in the primary colonizers, we have the blue complex, the violet complex and the yellow complex. Now what is the meaning of primary colonizers or the early colonizers? As the name is suggesting, these complexes or these bacteria, they are the first ones which attach themselves on the tooth surface or on the pellicle layer, meaning they are the first one to colonize in our oral cavity. That is why the name is given as primary colonizers. Now the blue complex, as you all can see, it consists of actinomyces species. The violet complex or the purple complex, it consists of Velunella parvulla and A. odontolyticus and the yellow complex it consists of streptococcus species like streptococcus mitis, oralis, sanguis, gordoni and intermediates. So this was about the primary colonizers. Now coming to the secondary colonizers. We can ha see here it consists of orange complex, green complex and the red complex. So again, what are secondary colonizers? As the name is suggesting, the secondary or the late colonizers, they colonize later on in the oral cavity. Meaning once the primary colonizers, they have attached themselves and they have bounded with the pellicle layer, then the secondary colonizers, they come into the picture and they colonize on the already colonized primary colonizers meaning that they themselves do not directly attach on the tooth surface instead they bind with the already bound primary colonizers that is why they are known as secondary or the late colonizers. Now the orange complex it consists of Prevotella species, Camp Campylobacter species like Prevotella intermedia, nigrosins, Fusobacterium nucleatum, Campylobacter rectus. The green complex, it consists of Capnocytophagia species, Echinella corodens, and the very, very important AA, that is Aggregatibacter actinomycetum comitans. It is found in the green complex. And the red complex, it consists of Porphyromonas gingivalis, B. forsythis, and Treponema denticola. It is also a very important complex when we discuss about periodontitis and the name red complex is given to it because this complex is associated with bleeding on probing. Bleeding that is why the name red has been given to it. So now we have discussed about the various complexes, microbial complexes. Another complex. So apart from those uh, six complexes which we have discussed, there is another complex that is the silver complex which was given by slots in the year 2003. So this complex is the viral complex as uh, it was found later on that the periodontal disease they are not only caused by the bacteria but also they have a viral etiology. So this silver complex it consists of various viruses like herpes simplex type 1 virus, Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus. Now coming to another important 
subject of discussion that is biofilm so what is a biofilm coster on in the year 1978 defined biofilms as matrix enclosed bacterial populations which is adherent to each other and or to the surfaces or interfaces now plaque is a biofilm but it is not necessary that biofilms are only found inside oral cavity we have we daily encounter biofilms in our day to day lives they are present all around us any surface any solid surface which is exposed to bacteria which contains fluid forms a biofilm for example biofilms may be formed at the base of the ships at the inner surface of water pipes and on the rocks which are present in the seas so all of these result uh, in the formation of biofilms and one of the most important thing that it consists of fluid channels it consists of highly permeable fluid channels which act as a means of exchange of nutrients and metabolic products and it forms a primitive circulatory system so these channels are one of the main uh, property of a biofilms now exopolysaccharide forms the backbone of the biofilm and it gives certain very important properties to biofilm that is it helps to maintain the integrity of biofilm it prevents the attack by harmful agents here by harmful agents we mean antimicrobials or antibiotics and it assists in the retention of extracellular enzymes because of this coating or because of this exopolysaccharide a biofilm the bacteria which are present inside the biofilms they are safe or they are resistant towards the attack by antibiotics and antimicrobial agents now another important property of biofilm is quorum sensing so what is quorum sensing it is a method of intercellular communication or it is the way by which the different micro colonies or the different bacteria inside the biofilm they interact with each other or they exchange information with each other what happens uh, once the signaling compound they reach a threshold level a particular gene expression is carried out or is activated for example resistance uh, towards antibiotics or resistance towards antimicrobial agents that is a property which is present in biofilms so this diagram it is representing or by this diagram you can better understand how quorum sensing works so here we can see that these are the signaling molecules and here are the receptors now slowly the signaling compounds are uh, molecules are released and they attach to the receptors in the initial stages these signaling compounds are very few so it represents the harmless type once the threshold is reached and a large number of signaling compounds are released a particular gene expression is carried out so this is how quorum sensing works now quorum sensing it gives distinct properties to biofilms uh, we have discussed about few earlier like it helps in expression of genes for antibiotic resistance it encourages the growth of beneficial species to the biofilm and discourages the growth of its competitors also it results in alteration of physiologic properties of bacteria in the community so these are the properties given by quorum sensing to the biofilms so now it's time for a short break let us do some breathing exercise so that we can be fresh again breathe in and out out
now coming to the formation of dental plaque. Formation of dental plaque, it takes place in three stages. First is the stage of pellicle formation on the tooth surface. Then it is initial adhesion and attachment followed by the colonization and plaque maturation. All the stages are very important and it is important that we know how these uh, stages they are carried out and ultimately these result in the formation of matured plaque. So to begin with the first stage that is formation of dental pellicle. Now what is a pellicle? A quiet pellicle it is defined as a homogeneous membranous acellular film that covers the tooth surface and is formed between the tooth and the dental plaque and calculus. So this is the first layer which is formed on the tooth surface within the 30 minutes and uh, within 24 hours the pellicle is around 0.1 to 0.8 micrometer in diameter. It is derived from saliva, crevicular fluid as well as the bacterial and the host tissue cell products and the food debris. So this is the acquired pellicle which is formed on the tooth surface and it consists of various components like statherin, silated mucins, protein, proline rich proteins, salivary agglutinins. These all they form, uh, they act as addition sites for bacterial receptors. We have already discussed that it is the first layer which forms on the tooth surface and it consists of these proteins. These and the primary colonizers which have the bacterial receptors, they attach with their receptors onto these adhesion binding sites on the acquired pellicle. Now what are the functions of dental pellicle? It acts as a protective barrier, it helps in lubrication, it prevents the tissue from desiccation and as we have already discussed it acts as a substrate to which the bacteria attaches. Now coming to the second stage that is initial adhesion and attachment of bacteria. Now a single mechanism cannot be attributed or uh, given to the formation of adhesiveness of microorganisms. Various proce processes are related for example transport to the surface then in the initial adhesion followed by attachment and then colonization of the surface and biofilm formation. We will discuss them one by one. First of all coming to transport to the surface. Now the first stage involves the initial transport of the bacterium to the tooth surface and how does it takes place? Random contacts may occur through Brownian motion, sedimentation of microorganisms, liquid flow and active bacterial movement. Through all these mechanisms random contacts may occur and may result in the transport of bacteria to the tooth surface. Now initial adhesion, the initial adhesion means the first step of when the bacteria attaches to the surface this kind of adhesion is reversible and it takes place by the interaction between the long range and the short range forces which includes the van der Waals attractive forces and the electrostatic repulsive forces. Now the total interaction energy is also called as the total Gibbs energy that is denoted by GTOT here and it is a sum of the van der Waals forces plus the electrostatic repulsive forces. So initially the addition which takes place is of reversible kind in nature and later on it becomes irreversible. So this was the phase of initial adhesion. After initial adhesion attachment takes place that is there is a firm anchorage which is established between the bacterium and the surface and it is uh, it takes place by specific interactions like covalent ionic or hydrogen bonding. Okay? So, initial after initial adhesion 
these kind of bonds are formed which results in the firm anchorage between the bacteria and the surface. Now coming to colonization and plaque maturation. First of all, again to repeat very important the early colonizers which were the yellow complex, the white, uh, violet complex and the blue complex which consists of the streptococci, the actinomyces species and the villionella species. So they bind with their receptors to the adhesion sites which are present on the pellicle layer which is formed on the tooth and they are the first ones to colonize on the tooth surface. So what they do? All these bacteria, the early colonizers, they are aerobic in nature meaning they use oxygen for their growth and once they use this oxygen in the initial stages of binding, what they do? They lower the reduction oxidation potential of the environment which means that once they have utilized the oxygen, there is deficiency of oxygen in the environment and the environment, this kind of environment which is devoid of oxygen, it will then favor the growth of anaerobic species which were the late or the secondary colonizers. So this is how uh, the cycle goes on. The early colonizers, they bind to the pellicle layer, they utilize all the oxygen as they are aerobic in nature and this favors the growth of the anaerobic species or the secondary colonizers. So here the diagram represents the tooth surface over which the acquired pellicle layer is formed at in and this acquired pellicle it consists of the adhesion sites. These are the adhesion sites over which the primary colonizers or the early colonizers they attach themselves with the help of their receptors. So this is the first stage. Now after this what happens? Secondary colonizers they come into play. These are the microorganisms which do not initially colonize on the tooth surface. For example, Prevotella intermedia, Prevotella loshae, Capnocytophaga species, Fusobacterium and Porphyromonas gingivalis. These are the late colonizers. Now, this we had discussed tooth surface, acquired pellicle, primary colonizers binding to the pellicle. Now, the secondary colonizers or the late colonizers have come and they have attached to the already bound primary colonizers. Now here it is important to note we can see Fusobacterium nucleatum. So this bacteria it acts as a bridge between the primary and the secondary colonizers meaning it has got the property to attach itself to the primary colonizers also and to the late colonizers also. It can bind with almost all kinds of bacteria. Now coming to another important thing that is co-aggregation. So what is co-aggregation? It is the, it can be better defined as the ability of distinct species or a genera in the plaque which have the ability to adhere to each other. This is known as co-aggregation. Now, various kind of co-aggregation exist within the dental plaque. For example, we have discussed already Fusobacterium nucleatum, it adheres to all other human oral bacteria. Prevotella loci, it binds with A viscosis. Capnocytophagia or Cretaceous, it binds with A uh, viscosis. And Streptococcus, it shows intrageneric co-aggregation, which means that it has the ability to bind to the nascent monolayer of already bound streptococci meaning it is not necessary that streptococci will bind to some other bacteria, it will adhere to some other bacteria. It has the property to bind itself to the already bound streptococci species and in later stages co-aggregation is seen between different gram-negative species like Fusobacterium nucleatum, Porphyromonas gingivalis and Tryponema denticola. Now the most common examples of co-aggregation in dental plaque are the formation of corn cob structure and the test tube brush structure. They have derived their name from the shape or the structure which they form 
once the coaggregation is done. For example, the corn cob formation, it resembles the structure of a corn cob because in this the streptococci, it adhere to the filaments of bacterinema species or fusobacterium nucleatum and give it an appearance of a corn cob like structure. And the test tube brush as we can see here due to coaggregation, a structure is formed which resembles the test tube brush or the bottle brush. Now what are coaggregation bridges? A coaggregation bridge is formed when the common partner bears two or more types of coaggregation mediators. These mediators they can be various types of polysaccharides or adhesins or it can be a combination of the two. So these are the coaggregation bridges. Now coming to another important thing that is dental plaque formation and its relation to time. So let us begin with it. After one hour or at the one hour bacteria it adheres to the pellicle and pellicle coats the enamel. In during the first hour gram positive rods and cocci are laid down. Now uh, within 24 to 48 hours bacteria they multiply and they form mini colonies in layers upon the pellicle layer which has been formed. The, in, during this hour uh, the bacteria they adhere and increase in the mass and the thickness both. Now within 4 to 7 days as the plaque thickens at the cervical area there is abundance of filaments and fusiforms, forms and uh, this from gram positive population it eventually turns into being gram negative population okay and in this stage bleeding and probing bleeding on probing and erythema both can be seen so from gram positive the population has turned to gram negative and initially there was simply rods and cocci and now we can see more of filaments and fusiforms. Now at 7 to 14 days as the plaque continues to mature there is abundance of vibrio spirochetes white blood cells in as we go deep in the deeper layers it becomes more of anaerobic population and gram negative organisms and then in this stage the signs of inflammation are more pronounced meaning the erythema and bleeding on probing it becomes more pronounced during 7 to 14 days. Now at 14 to 20 days, Vibrio and spirochetes they continue to multiply. The bacteria they become highly organized filamentous and they arrange themselves perpendicular to the tooth surface. Obviously the signs of inflammation becomes more pronounced as the plaque matures. Now we have learned how the plaque formation takes place, uh, what are the different stages in the formation of plaque its relation to time. Another important thing is that we should be able to detect plaque. So the agent which is used for detection of plaque is known as disclosing agent and it is a preparation in the liquid, tablet or lozenges form which contains a dye or any other coloring agent. For example, iodine preparation, Bismarck brown, erythrocene, fast green and basic fusion. So here we can see that the teeth if they contain uh, the deposits or if they have the plaque to be more precise once we ask the patient to switch with the disclosing agent the disclosing agent will stain the areas where the plaque is present so it helps both in detection of plaque as well as to increase awareness and motivation amongst the patients now coming to the various theories behind plaque formation so Three important theories have been given. First is the non-specific plaque hypothesis. Second is the specific plaque hypothesis. And the third is the ecological plaque hypothesis. So let us see what they mean one by one. Coming to the non-specific plaque hypothesis, it was given by Thillade in the year 1976. So what he stated was that small amount of plaque it releases small amount of noxious products which is eventually uh, neutralized by the host and if the plaque is of in large quantity it will release a large amount of noxious products and it will not be a 
neutralized by the host and it can result in the progression of the disease or it may result in periodontitis. So, to better understand the non-plaque, uh, non-specific plaque hypothesis meant that quality of plaque is not important but the quantity is important meaning if the quantity is more the disease will be more if the quantity is less the disease will be less. So, he stated that periodontal disease results from elaboration of noxious products by the entire plaque flora and it led to the concept that control of periodontal disease depends on the control of the amount of plaque accumulation meaning the type of microorganisms which are present in the plaque they are not important but only the quantity is important. But uh, now coming to the specific plaque hypothesis, but before that we will uh, discuss why this non-specific plaque hypothesis was discarded. So, it was discarded because what was there? We, the scientists or the researchers, they observed that few individuals, they have a huge collection of plaque in their oral cavity, but out of those many, only few, they show the signs of conversion of gingivitis to periodontitis meaning although that uh, although most of them have lot of collection of plaque but all the gingivitis it does not turn into periodontitis. So, it led to the concept that only the deposition of large amount of plaque is not important. So, then came the specific plaque hypothesis which was given by Walter Losch in the year 1979. So, he stated that only certain plaque is pathogenic and its pathogenicity depends on the presence of or increase in the specific microorganisms. Meaning that quality is important and quantity is not important. Which means that if a plaque contains certain periodontal pathogens which are important for the progression into periodontal disease then only uh, it convert to periodontitis all plaque it does not have the potential to result in periodontitis and he supported this theory by giving example of aggregate vector actinomycetum comitans which is the main pathogen in aggressive periodontitis. So, in aggressive periodontitis patients the main feature is that the amount of destruction it does not correlate with the amount of plaque deposition which is there meaning that these individuals they have comparatively clean uh, oral cavity they have very much less deposition but we when we see the amount of bone loss it is huge. So, that is why because the plaque is less but it contains all the important or the potentially pathogenic bacteria which are capable of causing periodontal diseases. Now, the third theory was the ecological plaque hypothesis which was given by P.D. Marsh in the year 1994. He stated that a change in a key environmental factor will trigger a shift in the balance of resident plaque microflora and this might predispose a site to disease. So, this hypothesis is based on the theory that unique local microenvironment influences the composition of the oral microflora. Now, it can be understood by this diagram. When there is reduced plaque, there is a reduced inflammation resulting in lower gingival crevicular fluid and the population of the bacteria is basically gram positive flora which is responsible for maintaining gingival health. Now, when the plaque is increased, this changes from reduced to increased inflammation, the environmental changes take takes place and results in high GCF flow, bleeding, raised pH and temperature and there is an ecological shift resulting from gram positive to gram negative anaerobes and eventually it is converted to gingivitis from gingival health meaning there is a shift ecological shift which takes place from health to disease. Now criteria for identification of periodontal pathogens. In the 1870s Robert Koch postulated the criteria by which an organism can be judged to be causative agent in human infections. So, he gave the Koch postulates in which he stated that a pathogen must be routinely isolated from the diseased individual. We must be able to grow them in the pure culture in the laboratory and 
that pathogen must be able to produce a similar disease when inoculated into susceptible lab animals and from those lab animals we must be able to recover that particular pathogen only then that pathogen will be responsible for being associated with that human infection based on the postulates given by uh, Robert Koch, so Kransky in the year 1978 proposed the criteria by which periodontal microorganisms organisms may be judged to be potential pathogens. First was association. Now in association what he stated was that the particular pathogen must be associated with the disease. Elimination that the pathogen must show decrease in number or must be eliminated once the disease is resol resolved. Host response that pathogen must be able to elicit an alter host uh, response like altered hum humoral immunity. Virulence factor that pathogen must be capable of, capable of producing certain virulence factors like various toxins or enzymes and that Pathogen must be capable of causing disease in the experimental animal models. So now moving on to our last topic that is microbial shift from health to disease. So as the gingival health it shifts from the healthy condition to the diseased condition that is either to gingivitis or periodontitis. The following change is observed. The gram positive microorganisms they become predominated by the gram negative organisms. The cocci decrease from the cocci the population changes to rods and then to the spirochetes and the non-motile bacteria they decrease in number and the motile bacteria they predominate. Also the facultative anaerobes they reduce in their number because the environment becomes deprived of oxygen so there is predominance of obligate anaerobes. So, these are my references. For further reading, you can refer to the textbooks of Carenza, Linde and the following other books. So, this brings us to the last section that is the MCQs part. Let us begin with our questions. Definition of dental plaque was given by, we have already discussed it, it was given by WHO in the year 1961. So, the answer is the option B WHO by 9 in the year 1961. Moving on to our second question. Marginal plaque is a type of which kind of plaque? Is it the subgingival or the supragingival? So the answer is supragingival plaque. Now coming on to our third question. Subgingival plaque is rich in which kind of bacterial population? Is it the gram positive, gram negative bacteria or the fungi? We all know this, the answer is gram-negative microorganisms. Moving on to our fourth question, that is the microbial complexes. These were given by Sokransky. We have discussed it. It was given by Sokransky in the year 1998. Now, the fifth question, the red complex contains which of these bacteria? So, the answer is Porphyromonas gingivalis. Another question, which complex is associated with bleeding on probing? It is the red complex and hence the name is given red because it is associated with bleeding on probing. Now specific plaque hypothesis, it was given by Walter Loesch. Answer is option A. Transport of the bacteria to the tooth surface occurs by which of the following mechanism? Is it the Brownian motion, the liquid flow, the sedimentation or all of the above? So, it occurs by all of the three mechanisms. So, the option is answer D. Which is a primary colonizer? Meaning, which bacteria colonizes the pellicle first? So, the answer is option C that is streptococcus. And moving on to the last question, which is an example of bacterial interaction. Is it the quorum sensing, the corn cob formation or the test tube brush formation? So we all know the answer is all of these are the example of bacterial interactions. So option D is the correct option. So thank you everyone. This brings us to the end of today's lecture. For any queries you can write to me at the email id which is given at the bottom.
थैंक यू वंस अगेन